I'm very, very happy to introduce to you my long-term friend and colleague, Professor M. Shiva Kumar, who has retired as a professor, is a, is an honorary professor at the Central University at Hyderabad. Professor Shiva Kumar and I go back quite a long time. He was in fact a PhD, he, he did his PhD from the University of Madras under the tutelage of Professor P. M. Matthews, who is apparently not only well known as a particle physicist, he's also very well known as a, as a textbook writer in quantum mechanics, a textbook by Matthews and Venkatesan, which many of you must have seen. But today I learned from Shiva Kumar that Professor Matthews is now an expert on geomagnetism. He in fact has a theory of rotation of the earth, which produces a magnetic field, which is observed, which agrees with observations. Professor Shiva Kumar and I met for the first time at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences where he was a postdoc, his first postdoc was there. And after that, again, when he moved to the SN Most National Center for Basic Sciences as a postdoc. From 1990 onwards, Professor Shiva Kumar has been at the Central University of Hyderabad. And this in various stages from, I think he began as an assistant professor and then retired very recently as a professor in 2021. Professor Shiva Kumar is a representative of a not very popular area of work nowadays. It's the mathematical aspects of quantum field theory. That's his expertise. For some reason, this breed to which I also belong a little in a small way is almost <laughs> dying out because uh, it is hard. And Professor Shivakumar's research activities, which is substantial, has centered around various formulations of quantum field theory and their applications to not only condensed matter problems, believe it or not, but also to astrophysics problems and black holes. So he has a wide repertoire of applications of quantum field theory to various branches of physics. This is his, his expertise. Now, how, however, the title of the talk today tells us, this is again something that I've learned today because we haven't seen each other for a long time, of his great and abiding interest in the education, in physics, higher, higher uh, education in physics, how to proceed. I mean, this is a subject which all of you would be keenly interested as professors, as teachers, as students, as postdocs, whatever your, your uh, current activity is, so without further ado, let me invite Professor M. Shiva Kumar to tell us about his views on higher education in physics. Yeah. Oh, this is the this is the and this is not designed to be a scale. Ah, yes. And this and then up and down. You can use this, yeah. Yeah. So let me just. No, this is up and down, right? Up and down, I think. Yeah, up and down also works. That's Which right. one? Wait, wait, wait. This is full screen. Right? Yeah, this is full screen, so it it should work. This is full screen. This is full screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me try. Okay. Okay. Um, first, at the outset, I wish to thank Suchetana for uh, inviting me for this uh, program. And uh, I'm very happy to come to this presidency university. It's my first visit here. And I'm very uh, happy to thank Super Partho Majumdar, my long time friend, for the kind introduction. In fact, I started my postdoc here in Calcutta in uh, SN Bose National Center for Basic Sciences. I was the first, one of the first appointees, our first postdoc when it was in a small uh, temporary building. Uh, and uh, so I've been involved in, uh, interested in physics education, which I will like to uh, see in what way I have been uh, interested or involved in it. <laughs> so as I said, uh, the title we have is, in higher education in physics, what are the problems and prospects? 
uh, usually when I mention and talk about it to several people, especially to sponsor us and fund givers and all. And one question they always ask me, so why don't you start from a school education? After all, you catch the students young and the school education, if you do, those students will do well, right? And why do you want to go for higher education directly? Because after all, school education is the basic things. If that is set right, everything else will set right. So to answer, to preempt such a question, my first talk will be, before I go for higher education, why didn't, I mean, why not a school education? Why don't we start with my school education? See, in a higher education, by higher education, I mean BSc and MSc colleges. That is what I have my definition of higher education, not a research institutes. So the typical BSc and MSc colleges across India is in a very abysmal condition, except for islands of excellence. And uh, these islands of excellence may exist generally in a big metro cities. If you leave those poles in the plain, right, most of the places in India is made up of a rural kind of places where things will be much in a worse condition than you would expect in a main uh, cities. So first thing is, uh, so even to get a good school education, you need good school teachers. And those school teachers are going to come from your BSc and MSc colleges. Unless your college education is going to improve, whatever you try to change, bring a change in the school education by doing, say, helping the school teachers will be only a temporary solution. So it will be just giving a painkiller for a fracture rather than really address the basic issue. A basic issue. And uh, the problem also uh, may exist even to go for a research. Right. Ultimately, these are students from BSc and MSc college, colleges. Unless these students are taught properly, you are not going to get a good research level education. Therefore, if you unless you focus on your BSc and MSc colleges, neither the school education is going to be benefited, nor the higher education is going to be benefited. Therefore, the the, the crux of the or the or the abysmal condition in the full education lies in handling the school higher education in this one. <clears throat> so with this um, thing, so let me see what are the problems in our higher education according to our, us. I mean, by us, I will tell you whom, I mean, towards the end. Uh, if you look at the traditional teaching methods in a college, I mean, which is been, all of us have been going through, gone through and going through, maybe <laughs> go, we'll go through in future also. It is mostly, the classrooms is all so teacher-centric teaching. So it is teacher who keeps talking in the board for several minutes and the students passively takes down notes. And as long as the teacher is very happy that he has delivered a lecture and the students just take down notes, the teacher is very happy and student is very happy. But then is that a way a, a teaching has to be sort of a thing or is that an alternate way of doing it? And the students are, not just a passive listeners, not an active participant in the classes. And generally in the level of teaching or problem solving, there is no scope for peer learning. So it is mostly, it's only the students just learn, listen to the teachers and that's the only way they learn. And more than the theory, there is slightly better because theory, there are concepts to understand, problems to give, problems to do, that can help to improve the physics understanding. In contrast to that, the practicals or the experimental situation uh, everywhere is in a completely, you know, I mean, in our opinion, it's in a very bad situation because all the experiments are all only nothing more than a cookbook recipes. What do you do in experiments? Everything is given. Teacher gives, including the what the aim of the experiment, what tables to draw. What are the tabular columns to go? Right? What should be done? All students have to be like a robotic machine. Can never ask questions. If you say physical balance, take three, rating, turning point, left side, two, right side. Right, you can't ask, sir, why three like this? Why not three? You can't ask. So the scope of all of them are less. And the whole lab session is done. Is not much different from the kitchen uh, giving a cookbook, cookbooks. Right? And there is no scope for students to innovate, ask questions, try, fail. For all of them, it is not there. As long as you know how to turn the knobs, you are a good experimentalist. 
there is even much worse situation is happening nowadays namely there's all lot of black box experiments are there all equipments are all there you uh, turn something you can even do measure anything you can measure velocity of light in your lab or planck's constant or you know verify bell's uh, inequality all of them you can do you don't even know what is contained you know people don't even know what it is there so this kind of a black box experiments uh, it is also um, i mean it is also in our opinion is really killing the physics education so these are the issues which are there but then finding out the problem is not a, is is easy but the more difficult is okay you tell all this what is it you want to replace it with is the most important thing any issue any thing is a problem. it's always easy to say that this is wrong that is wrong this is wrong but then we have to say that okay then tell me what is right okay that is what we want to address and that is what we have tried to answer so first thing is nowadays there is a change in focus first of all from a student uh, teacher centric learning to it has come to student centric learning students learn when they discover when they discover need not mean that some very new discovery or anything even in a classroom if their students are some kind of a active learners where students and teachers have a more interactive learning ask questions go around why i am saying this why you are saying it why not this happens right if that kind of interactions are going to take place then the classroom will be very interesting thing <clears throat> and uh, i mean they generally the scope of a teacher is more to brainwash the students into believing what they are trying to teach so brainwashing is not uh, no if you want to teach quantum mechanics i want to make you accept this is correct right so almost all the subjects when a teacher is, uh, teaches it is the goal of a teacher in in a traditional way is to brainwash you into accepting this and in in our opinion sometimes you know uh, they would they learn to get brainwashed by the regular level of teaching right and therefore uh, you know we i mean sometimes i used to think you know some very educated people doing things which is not commensurate with their education and all because they get brainwashed right then they will say that okay you are brainwashed they learn to brainwash somebody is brainwashing them much better then they are doing these things right so the goal is to see that our education is to you know to see that they don't get brainwashed right so the current way of doing learning is that it is the teacher centric learning is mostly to brainwash students to believing whatever you are teaching okay so that is something that's why that is actually i would say fight back of a teacher trained a teacher centric kind of a learning these things <clears throat> and there should be scope for peer learning because only when you learn discuss with others on physics related discussions as a part of education if they learn they not only learn physics they learn communication they learn you know to understand to explain yourself all of them will be part of these things nowadays many times you know you say communication is important you give a separate course for one hour uh, classes somewhere okay but those things are i'm not saying they are unimportant but it will be good if they are integrated as a part of their learning in our regular class itself right okay? and actually people will learn only if you like mistakes unless you try fail right improvise and that's the only way you learn even in problem solving you first learn to make mistakes right then you will learn correct yourself what is the way of doing it and there should be scope for that kind of a thing and with the student centric learning there be offshoot is going to be you can develop a now a good communication skill and the leadership the most important thing is critical thinking that is the most important part of this <clears throat> now uh, having said that these are the good way of doing it you now i want to see the, what is it we have been doing to uh, address these issues to implement it in a uh, in uh, programs so we have been running <clears throat> i mean before that there are a lot of new pedagogic styles are also there so i mean i would say like as much as research is undergoing new developments pedagogy is also undergoing new developments one should keep uh, aware and be abreast with the developments by, by in pedagogy which includes discussion with the psychologists right which includes discussion with other sociologists and uh, also uh, i mean generation to generation their knowledge the way the information gets 
processed, right? And these are all very much different. So unless we take that into account, we would not be uh, mean doing a good justice for the education. So there are some things called clicker, clicker questions, which are again gadgets are there. You can ask questions in a class and ask them how many of you agree with this, how many of you disagree with this, right? And uh, this is, will be, um, it, it will be anonymous. The first students may not feel shy to say I agree or disagree. Right. And that will uh, immediately, you will get a completely data for this person. This many students have said this. Then you will know that students have not understood. Teacher can do the corrective measures on it. And on that way, will be to always have a Socratic type questioning in the class. Right. Every ask them, why, why, why don't you believe? Why, why? And that question of why should come, that answering. And that is where the learning has to be one. And the problem solving being the group, right, instead of working it individually. Right. If they work in a group and they discuss the problem and doing it, there'll be more peer learning will be there. And that is when they would really be certainly learn. Nowadays, there is something called a flipped classroom, which is again developed by uh, Harvard University. There's one physics uh, 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 optics person, uh, um, Mathur, I think. Ah, Eric Ma, yeah, Eric Mathur, yeah, yes. So he has developed, he has initiated this idea of a flipped classroom. So it means students will, I mean, they will learn some basically what is it I'm going to do, they will learn. And the teacher will be to learn, discuss only the nuances of that. And they will tell that, right, and one student can help the other. And the classroom will be only to handle that aspect of that. This again requires students to be more active and come in a proactive way, learn and come. That's a flip side of this. And also there are some ideas called like interactive <coughs> Simulations are there. This is to explain concepts. So this again is a Carl Weyman from uh, Colorado University as a thing. So these are all some ideas are there I mean, of uh, implementing these things. And see, whatever it is, ultimately uh, we have to adapt any of these new developments depending on the local needs. Having one size fits for all kind of a solution will not be a sustainable solution. Therefore, we whatever one faces and discusses. Uh, we have to see that depending on the local class, local conditions, local management uh, rules and all of them, one should try to see how much one can try to uh, do that. So <clears throat> with these things, we have, been, uh, we have uh, been running a program which is called a physics training and a talent search. <clears throat> uh, it's in short form with PTTS. In mathematics, there is been a program called a MTTS. It's called a mathematics training and talent search. Is there anybody who has Heard of MTTS? You heard? Yeah. So this has been running for the last 30 years. Um, I mean, the yeah, thing is that this is run, funded completely by the uh, government. Uh, DAE has for National Board of Higher Mathematics, right? They have been funding this program for the last 30 years. And they have been doing, they also try to have some innovation in uh, teaching mathematics for the BSc and MSc level students. So some of us, we've been thinking and asking ourselves, why not have a similar program for physics also? So only thing we had was, this name was the first thing. We just said that we'll start a program with PTTS, which is uh, completely borrowed from that. But then apart from that, we have I mean, no organic uh, relation connection between them because their program is different. And also we can't borrow because that subject is different. Right? Each subject, uh, what we have to innovate the, the problems and what should be replacing with it should be looked at case by case. What we do for physics will not going to work for chemistry. What works for physics and chemistry will not work for biology and all. Therefore, we have to completely look at it by things. Therefore, we have ourselves I mean, evolved say, what are the ways and which we are also been practicing it. So <clears throat> um, this program we have been running since 2015. So far, we have run about seven programs. The details of all the programs, I will come uh, in a due course. But then our core ideology is to teach them learn to learn. So that is what we are more um, interested. It is not just so much of uh, teaching quantum mechanics or classical mechanics. The process of learning that we want to give that as an equal importance as much as just teaching them a subject. Right? It is not just giving fishes, but teach them fishing is whatever broad the thing is. So our motto is learn to learn. And uh, the process we want to do is called active learning. So in fact, our uh, logo itself, it says experience active learning. Um, 
by active learning is to oppose with a passive listening uh, than the students has. Therefore, we want to see the students are you know, actively participate in the classroom. So how do we implement these things? That's our thing. Before that, the broad ideology of our program of this is, uh, we want to say that whom to teach, what to teach and how to teach. These are the three things. We've been basically running training programs. That's our thing. So for these training programs, what are the methodology and what we are doing? That's what I'll be doing in the rest of the talk. Okay. So here I've gone out of the broad philosophy to come to precisely what is it we are doing it in the ground level, right? That is what I want to, I mean, what I'll be emphasizing on the rest of the talk. Okay. So the broad ideology is first whom to teach. At least we know for sure whom not to teach. We are not going to bother about teaching students from IIT, ISIS and all those places. Because anyhow, they are all getting a good teaching, good training at all. Our goal is to reach out to people who don't have an access for a good education. Therefore, we will go for places, not even in the metro cities, but people in the rural areas or you know, places like that, we want to address to them. Because we believe that in every place, in a class of 50 students, there'll be one or two students who will be highly motivated, who may be I mean, in Nagapattanam or uh, some Sivakasi or some small place in that. And there'll be one or two teachers who will be motivating them. Rest of the things may not be much be below the par in that. But these students also don't, right? They are all isolated. Same teachers are also isolated. We won't have a network of such people who are in smaller villages and smaller places. Right? And so that is what we are wanting for. Whom to teach, right? At least uh, that it should be aimed primarily for those people. Second is what to teach. Our goal is to teach, uh, lay the foundations quite strong. We don't want to teach them some very esoteric and advanced things, right? Uh, what would be the latest development in that when that even the basics are going to be very weak in that. Before what we teach is whatever they are expected to learn in the regular curriculum. The same subject only we will teach. We are not going to teach any advanced topics at all. When we say typical coursework, if I take a BSc second year student, we teach them waves and oscillations or quantum theory or you know mechanics and subjects of that, whatever they are I mean, going to do that. Third is how to teach. That is what whole exercise is going to be. The how to teach will be, at least it will not be in a conventional way. It will be whether some teacher is using a PPT or just will be talking on the board for uh, you know, 45 minutes or 90 minutes, right? Those kind of a things we will not have this happen. <coughs> Students must be an active participants in the class. This active learning is going to be the first thing in that. So this is a broad uh, ideology with which we have been running the program. The program detail. So we have got a basic program which we have been running is an annual program. Uh, that's the PTTS program. And uh, uh, this is what we have been running for the last uh, seven years. And the pro program is generally it is a three weeks program. The first two years we were running for a two weeks program. Once we got a little bit more stronger, then we have moved into a three weeks program. Typically, the classroom will choose about 50 second year BSc students and about 35 first year MSc students. Actually, we can take 50 also, but what we found is that many a times students drop out when they get an internship somewhere, they're just before, not two days before the program, people they drop out and we end up only with uh, less students. So we thought we'll stick to 35. I will come to funding and all these things as a day, as a things process. There are many standard questions, whatever you can, everything is going to be answered. <clears throat> the course will be uh, two theory courses and one experimental physics. Before the session will be morning 9 to 10.30, one theory course. 11 to 12.30 will be another theory course. 2 to 4 will be a tutorial session. Then 4.30 to 6.30 will be a lab session, experimental physics session. This is a daily routine. For six days a week, we work. So the typical courses is like take a BSc, it's quantum electricity and magnetism. Quantum mechanics means at MSc level, well, I mean, it's in the, well, the first introduction of this. We have been running this program in different locations in India. <coughs> and 
the thing is uh, how do we select students this selection of students has also sort of evolved from year to year the last two years or so the three years we have come to the following uh, thing uh, the way we uh, do is i mean we uh, we have a website it's called pttas.org.in and in that a student has to log in and register once advertisement comes that we are going to run the program then once they register after giving the, the details at the end there will be one random question will come to them what we have done is we have a question bank which we have created and then we have seen that among this question bank one question comes randomly so this question bank is separate for a bsc and msc we run two levels level one is a bsc students Level two is MSc students. They don't sit together. They separate classes for BSc and a separate classes for MSc students. And then they have a separate, uh, I mean, these kind of a questions. And important thing is that uh, these questions we tell them they can take any time to submit. They can they can submit even before the last working day. That is enough. We tell them that you can refer any books, you can refer any resources, except don't discuss among yourself. Or ask teachers. And we tell them in the instruction very, very clearly, we want to test only your thinking skill. We are not interested in seeing whether your answer, final answer is right, what is right, and all. Even if some statements are wrong, but if he says there is a spark in it, he is able to think something differently, right? Then we say, oh God, this is good. So we have chosen problems like that. Since many of you are potential <laughs> people who may apply, I have not uh, given what are their questions. Uh, for the other people, when there are, I know for sure, when there are no questions, that I give them an example questions of what kind of a questions we ask. Okay. Then these students have to have a handwritten notes, no multiple choice questions. They have to write down the answers. And uh, generally, what way we also do is some of these problems we give you five subdivisions. First to two will be a kind of a throwaway level thing, third, fourth will be an increasing level, fifth will be very difficult. And sometimes, and many times we have questions which will be based on th three things. One is some observation. What are things and make an observation and then say, how will you explain it qualitatively? Right? So if they want to see that physics is, you know, something you see in your day-to-day -day life, right? It is an observation phenomenon you see, right? So that is what we try to see whether they do. Second thing is they see whether uh, they can, Take from one examples, they know how to generalize it further. This skill is one of the things we see. Second thing is, if you gave some examples, right, from analogy, can you go for the different situations, right? Whether these kind of things, whether they can do or not, right? These kind of questions is what we raise. And then we allow students to, yeah, I mean, answer that. Okay? Then they have a handwritten answer. We tell them, you know, you give as detailed answer as possible. So that we are not interested in finding fault with what you are doing it. We are interested in doing, right? We want to search for what is a spark in that, right? That is what we are sort of interested. So these students upload the answer. So last two years, we've been getting about 900 papers, okay? Um, about 500 in level one, 100, 500 or 400 in level two and all. We organize as three of us. We sit down and we evaluate each of these papers. <laughs> Only one question, we evaluate these papers and give marks for these students. Okay. That is one word. And then we give marks out of five. Okay. So see, actually sample question, I have removed it only here for the others I used to keep. Okay. Then what do we do with that? With, uh, we evaluate the marks, we tabulate all the marks. Then, yeah, okay, marks out of three, out of five. Then we take only, we look at only students who are getting more than three and above. One and two means we completely, we don't even look at that. They are completely neglected. Then out of three, we, we make it a point to see that um, among the applicants, we make it a note from which institution they are coming from. BSc from a college, where that college is located. If the college is located in Pune or Calcutta or Chennai, they are classified as urban. And if they are not in some Tenkasi or some place like that, Right, or Nasik or some place like that, we say this is going to be in urban. So we have for every state, we have some classification of three or four as a metro and other as an urban. So we classify that, then we select people from 
Then we see to it that among the total applications, among the selected people, 50%, roughly 50% are from urban background. That is, the colleges I mean, resides in an area which is not in a metro city or not in an urban city. Okay, that is the first criteria. Second criteria is 50% are women. That is our second thing. 50% are going to be a women candidate. Third is, we see that there are representation from all states. So whichever state, then we first look at application by state-wise in Excel sheet we divide. Then from each state, some representation is there. Otherwise, Calcutta will, everyone will come from <laughs> West Bengal only. See, we are not, as I said, our goal is not to check for the top five people. That's, we, do, we, we don't want to do that. It will be a very easy job to say that, take the top 35 or top 50 people and then select them. Because our goal is not so much to search talent in absolute sense of the word, that we are completely doing it from a social conscious point of view. Okay. So that's with that thing, we are, I mean, this all, all takes a very time consuming thing, but then it fits in our broader social consciousness of that. So that all states have a representation. <clears throat> Actually, sometimes what we do is if, um, you know, yeah, if you find a very good woman candidate, if it's from a smaller institution, here BSc students and all, in the earlier days, we found that sometimes student parents are not willing to send the girl to a longer period for a three weeks, right, which is far away. And many of them, they would not have even left their home, right, for more than a week and all. So what sometimes if I see some good candidate and all, right, then we should not lose such a good candidate. So what we'll do is if it is possible, we'll try to accommodate one more student from the same college so that parents will be inclined to send both of them together. Right, they'll say, okay, somebody said you are also going, okay, he will send. So we take care of parents' psychology also when we do these things. What is the teaching methodology? First thing is, I mean, we have actually prepared, we have kind of a guidelines for, uh, you know, for teachers going to teach um, PDDS program. So guidelines for resource persons we have prepared. And we suddenly, when we ask uh, people to approach people, I will send them that you know, this is what we would want, our broad ideology is going to be. So, and then we also, we call and also tell them that this is what we want it to be. <laughs> First thing is no PPT, of course, that's very obvious. And uh, there won't be you no know, continuous uh, 90 minutes keep talking. So we have to emphasize that every, I mean, it's a bit quite difficult because everybody is sort of attuned to just keep lecturing. Right, bringing the change is not a very I mean, sort of a easy thing. The way we also do is every now and then we interrupt. In fact, we emphasize, we also tell, I mean, all of us will be there. We insist that teach other teachers also attend. Even some guest scientists who come for the program, we ask them to come and attend. Right, and we tell all of them, or we tell the resource persons beforehand itself. We will all intervene and ask questions. When we ask questions, don't think that I don't know the answer. Right? Uh, I, not that I'm, I mean, I, I expect that you don't know the answer. It is not that. Right? Students learning must be to ask a very good question. They should learn that what is a mature question to ask. So this can see it from an example. When a teacher code, when somebody is teaching, you know, we can just say that, if, uh, I mean, we could have seen, you know, this is a kind of a good question a student should have asked. If it is not that, I stop and ask them, say, in this situation, what will happen? Right? So then students wakes up and then say, yeah, that's a kind of question which I did not find. In the feedback form, when we get people realize this part as a, they have specifically mentioned that, you know, I mean, they learned, uh, appreciated a lot, but this kind of uh, intervention. Yes, so because, you know, uh, when, uh, people like presidency and all, it may not be true, it may not hold, but many places, undergraduate level, the students are not even allowed to ask questions. If students ask their questions and all, it will be, teacher will think that you are questioning me. Therefore, for them, it's even the first time they are be happy to see that, you know, in a classroom, a teacher says something, I can ask a question, right? That itself is a revealing thing for them. Given that situation, we should not only just ask them to ask vague questions. Many times students ask sometimes very vague questions, which is they may want to ask and they may not know what, right? Therefore, they have to see as an, as an example or experience, what are the mature questions which can come only when you are allowed to, right? others stop and ask, which now at our age of this one, we will be knowing, right? We know the answer also, 
right? And we would have learned it only when we come to at the at lecturer or professor level, at the student level, we would have got the same uh, misunderstanding or understanding of whatever they had. Okay, so whatever I have gained from my, uh, you know, so many years of uh, gray hair science I've got, right, that uh, experience, I should share it with you at a thing so that sort of, what should I say, you mature fast. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, what we try to do. And one more thing we want to emphasize will be that don't compartmentalize the subject. When you learn one subject, if you teach quantum mechanics, you should see that a similar concept, what happens in classical, what happens in statistical, EM theory, so that kind of thing is very important. Your mind should learn to sweep all these things. This is something, again, when you find, when you write an equation, they will be able to understand the equation written in mathematical physics. The same equation, if you change a variable, it comes to physics. Many a time, people are not able to link the both these things, which as a teacher, by sometimes we would be sort of annoying. Maybe as a student, we all went through that. Maybe I do, right? But um, this is the kind of a thing which they should learn, right? The subjects, they're all integrated. Because many developments also happen, you know, when you learn from one subject, you are going to apply that is when many developments are there. The first thing is don't compartmentalize the subject. We tell them that it should be broken like a Berlin wall, <laughs> right? <laughs> Difference, right? So when you want to break physics and biology, before that you should break walls between the subjects, physics itself, right? When you're teaching itself, right? Whatever you want to do at a research level, you do it at a classroom teaching itself. That is, that is in a uh, you know, broad sense. So other thing is that all are encouraged to ask on behalf of these questions. See, this is our typical tutorial. The way we do is we divide the class of 50 people into a batches of five students and form a group. When we make this group, we make a conscious decision to say these five students are from five different states. And they have to, and second thing is that we compel that, right, uh, they should uh, not speak in their mother tongue in the classroom. <clears throat> Even at lunchtime, if somebody sees them talking in their mother tongue in a group, if I pass that said, I will just group them. I mean, I just tell them you are not supposed to be able to do that. You have to speak in English. And then the tutorial is done like this. We give a problem sheet. We tell them first, don't even put pen on paper. First, you discuss amongst us what to do. Okay? That is the most important part of that. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, one more thing I do is in the blackboard tutorials, I say, no silence, no silence, please. So I keep... <laughs> so classroom must be, there'd be a lot of, there should be very animated discussion and action. They should be arguing for this, everything they should be able to do that, right? That should be the part of the learning in that. And we tell them, as long as if you know how the problem has to be approached, then 50% is done. You, then you can stop and you can, if you're interested, you can complete, do it later. Those 50% of, you know, how they should be done. And each person must discuss among yourself. And in this, all these things, teachers won't be, as we have a tutor in this program. We have for each course, one resource person who actually teaches and one tutor. So like this, there's one tutor was there. This tutor is just a job to go around and see whether they're going in a right direction. We don't, and what we don't do is we don't give the final solution and work out on the board. Sometimes we may give the final answer, what, what is the answer for that? If they want, they can just pin verify. But then the emphasis is more on this learning how to solve the problem, right? It is that part which is the most difficult thing. Like what is given, what is asked, which idea. So those kind of things they should discuss among themselves. It is only there they really learn. So they really enjoy it very much by learning, uh, by discussing among themselves. And another thing is that by this process, they learn to, uh, Communication is also sort of there. In fact, on the last day, we have a the valedictory function. We allow students to come. We allow to anyone to, that is the most important part. More than the return feedback, you know, I mean, they just come and tell whatever. And one student said, on the day when I came, I could not speak even a single uh, English sentence. Even to say how to go to the hostel, I could not um, communicate. See, now I'm coming and they're speaking in English. Right? He said, I mean, although there's a lot of grammatical mistakes and all that confidence was there, that I can come and uh, speak English. So, I mean, so this enforcing, this, even somebody works alone, we tell them this is not the way to do it. Right? You, I mean, in these days, it is not working alone important because you should learn to work with others. It gives you team teamwork, right? It helps you with communication, right? Among them, this gives you a leadership. Right? One of them will be really taking leadership and coordinating. All of them are the kind of a learning part. 
it is not just um, it is not just only teaching these things so in our broader sense you know education is not just teaching a particular domain something you teaching you must be they should learn everything by this process of osmosis you know by observing by actually doing small things that is where the real education has to come yeah. so so i mean this is uh, way we want to I mean, do for the thing so we have got two, three modules one is a uh, regular classes then tutorials third comes experiment i made so much of criticism about the experimental course therefore i should tell what i am going to do in my program <laughs> right so what we do is this the way it goes first thing is we divide the students in the group and these students for each group by lots they, i mean each student takes well, we have divide for 10 experiments we divide and this experiment will be made on one small piece of paper a small strip of paper right that's all in a small strip of paper it's like some bus ticket or something one line we'll give one line statement of the problem to be done Right. One typical problem is, you know, show experimentally force is a vector or something of that can we just give one line statement. Then we divide as the students and form into group of five people. For each people working in the group, they will to come together. Second thing is that these students, we tell them they have to tell us how they are going to do that experiment. So that part is a thing. second, third part is they should, we are not going to give them when anything, whatever they want, nothing, they tell them, and you know, you should tell what is it you need. You should tell what is the equipment you need. We tell them whatever you want, I will take you to the market that right? you can buy and thing. Because <laughs> I mean, that's the next important point is that you, whatever equipment you want, you can buy because to do this experiment, the total cost should not cross 300 rupees. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe it's a old one. It's inflation. <laughs> yeah, that's I wrote 200. The last year we made it into 300. It may this is again not a, see this 200 300 is not a rigid thing, right? It's a it's, and it is certainly not because we don't have funds, right? Because it's been many years we have even returned the money saying we are not able to use it. So it's not so much of a, a, right? but it is to force them to think independently. Right? They should be able to look for a so thing of actually doing it by hand. Right? It is for that. They say to do this, they need a pulley, they need something. They have to take something and doing it. If they say they need something, you'd see the next plan for how these things are done. We'll take a photograph. <laughs> what is not given? Instruction how to do is not given. What apparatus to do, that is not given. They should tell us. And the way it does is it's a three weeks course. First four or five days, each group shall come to the uh, here. They should tell on the blackboard, right? How they plan to do the experiment. Right? This is a conceptual thing, conceptualization to this one. And we also have in the first few days a lecture on error analysis. Okay. Then though it's a group of five people, each of them must do the in experiment individually. Right? Conceptualizing and deciding how to do can be done uh, collaboratively. But when they make an equipment, each of them should do individually. Generally, we see that there is also a measurement is also sort of involved in it. Right? Then so that they can measure. We also tell, and see for us, we tell that it is not the final answer which is very close to the experiment, which is important. For us, it's a process of learning is important. If you get the low, we don't make a judgment that, oh, you are success successful, that you got G into 9.8 and two G's got only G to 9.7, therefore your experiment is good. No. In fact, uh, one, yeah, in, in, even if they do, I mean, we did, even someone experiment found students did very well, though they got a result for a, a acceleration due to gravity was some 11 or 12 or something. But then the process, but then they learned a lot of things because every time they did, they failed. They learned that, oh God, this I did because I did not take friction into account. The, what should I put? This one, what should I do? I did not take that into account. Like that, then they said, oh, this was giving, I need something with a less contact. Then they realized, what should I do? One girl said, I will take my earring. And she took the earring and put, then it's just smoothly went. Then they all shouted. They said, you know, they clapped. Then we all raised what happened. They said, sir, if we put the earring, there's only one, it worked well, right? That's the learning. And that day experiment, they got only 11 or 12. It doesn't matter. You have learned more than somebody who got exactly 9.82 or something, right? So that's not what, okay? So the if here, the emphasis is on you learn. You learn by mistake, trial and error. That is the, the basic take home thing. Then just getting a number which is much closer to the main experiment. And the theory is also, I mean, so the, then final thing is that they should, uh, yeah, first one week it goes only in that. Then after five, six days, 
I mean, we tell them if they are not in the right direction in the discussion, we prod them, give helpful hint, and you put them in a right direction so that they will all go in this. We will also see that I will tell you how the program goes in it. Sometimes we have a solution for this, and students come with a solution which is different. Like we still accept them. You can just go ahead in that. So later we'll see I mean, how we plan for these programs. <clears throat> so the, the I mean, this is the first thing. Then um, yeah. So each group discusses individually. There should be discussion, presenting the idea. Last day, they have to make a presentation to the whole uh, class. And then we generally invite some the very, you know, very eminent scientists. And you'll see who are the kind of scientists we have invited. And they have to make this presentation in front of them. Each group must come say, this experiment I did. They have to, and students, they have to ask. And they will also go around checking that. Right? That presentation in front of yeah, VVIP, some kind of a scientist. That's a thing which is going to happen. <clears throat> Last day, it is given in terms of a chief guest. It's a well-directed function. We invite a chief guest, right? And uh, they have to make a presentation. If you see here, see, this was one of the labs. We just took an empty room, right? We just hired and get some chat. And this was in 2015, we did not get. This was one of the most uh, very successful thing where nothing was there. You see some of these experiments. Here you see whatever they need, they really have to take a PVC pipe, cut it, and they want to make a, you know, this is something like find the refractive index of a microscopic slide. I mean, maybe one of these. So whatever is required, they have to really make it themselves. Okay. So, so these are the kind of a thing which we did. This, these things, you know, yeah. <clears throat> okay. This is before that. Uh, I mean, until uh, 2018, uh, 2019, we, it was completely offline. Okay, we all had in a different places. Of course, 2020 we could not uh, hold it, though we 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 planned everything for the June. We identified the place. We spent lot of our own money and sent posters and awaiting. We are going to get funds and all. Then suddenly COVID came and everything was uh, sort of stopped. Therefore, 20 we did not uh, conduct this program. 21 and 22 it was held in a uh, online mode. So I was a bit skeptical in online mode, how this experimental course, right? I thought theory course would be successful and experimental course, how it is going to be. You can really see the, this program, how it went in a online mode. <laughs> online mode, what we did was, um, you see, if you remember 21 and 22, um, everybody was at home, right? They were not even, sometimes even the shops were not allowed to uh, open and all. So what we did was for everyone, to the residence address, we sent one multimeter, one toolkit, basic toolkit involving spanner and things, screwdriver and things like that. That was sent to the resident before the start of the program, or before the start of the actual experiments. Then, then we chose the experiments such that it didn't require a major facility. Generally, also we see it doesn't require some major sodium vapor lamp or something like that. So, I mean, we are that at least BSC level we are very particular about it. At MSC level, sometimes it may not be so. Uh, thing we may depend on. Uh, but when you do for online, we saw to it that nothing of those kind of a thing was not done. So we chose experiments which is not require a central facility. And then group discussions took place in a Zoom breakout rooms. So we had an experience at home. And then uh, again, two hours was given for the lab session. So in the last day, they have to come on video and they have to explain whatever experiments they did. Again, we got a scientist like Sri Ram Ramaswamy and people like that. They all came, uh, you know, and then they have to uh, show what is experiment given, what was the thing they did. So I have just taken some images of some experiments, which is all done. This is all done at home. It is not so much the experiment part, but you can really see that, you know, they could really take anything at home and they could be able to do it. Right? Which was again, just ideas were given. How to do was all done by this. For example, one experiment was something, if you remember, measure the joule constant or something, find a way of doing it. We'll try to see that it is don't do exactly, I mean, because something, whatever they did with the, uh, the lab, they can't really do it at home. Okay. So whatever it is, uh, experiments are all, you know, things uh, of this kind. Right? They just took uh, some, when one lab or somebody to went to the water tank and that was made into a lab. Right. So if you see all these experiments are all done at home, you see all of them are just take a, some experiment, whatever it is they could find hold of that, they made that, uh, use that, and they could do this uh, thing. <coughs> yeah. 
Then finally, the students come and make presentation. Right? So uh, in one year, uh, Ashok San came for our program as a chief guest, and these students made a presentation there. And uh, one year, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, he's uh, Ravinder Kumar from TAFI. So we, we generally invite uh, Infosys Award winners because they have been funding us. Our Infosys juries or something like that, like Rajaram Kananda, uh, people like that. Uh, I mean, those who are our people like that, uh, I mean, we invite. <laughs> So they, yeah, before that, we have to make a lot of background planning. <laughs> this academic program, what we do is, uh, we have an academic program meeting for a three to five days of meeting. Sir. So we have to decide on what are the experiments to give, and we have to plan how this experiments to be done. It should be able to do within, uh, it should not be over in one week, or it should not take more than three weeks to do. That is first thing. How to phrase the question in a one line, then whether these students will be in a position to find out by himself, right? Without our giving, whether these questions can it be done like that? All these kind of even to discuss and uh, and pass one question, it takes about three to four hours of discussion, uh, of very detailed discussion. We generally invite, um, I mean, uh, coordinators and my three of us coordinators, resource persons, uh, and sometimes we invite some uh, uh, some uh, uh, you know uh, guest scientists who are. I mean, around in the place and ask them to also take part. So, so they did just as a completely a brainstorming uh, meeting. Then, I mean, they have to, we have to see all these things. Can he come? So, and then if you want to do, we have a solution for these things, within these things, within 300 rupees, right? Within these three weeks, right? Within the physics, he knows as a BSc students, can he do it and all, okay? But as I said, sometimes students come with their own solution, which is different from what we do, right? As long as the physics is right, Okay, we just allow them to do because it is not so much the final answer for us is important. The learning is the most important part of that. And actually, we also do all these uh, tutorials and all we actually discuss what to give and everything that I can. So, see, we have been funded for the last uh, five years by Infosys Science Foundation. The way our funding went was 2015, I got uh, some funds from some uh, local uh, different research institutes like they for Hyderabad and HRI and uh, people like uh, IMSC, Minshara like that. And uh, you know, even Saha Institute gave about some amount. And then, uh, so with that uh, very small amount, with a small budget, nobody took a honorarium or anything. We just run the, this program. Then <laughs> it's uh, 2016, uh, yeah, uh, we got first time Infosys of our function, uh, Infosys Science Foundation, they gave took that. And one year I got funds from uh, uh, this uh, Triveni Trust, Ashok San Trans uh, Trust. So, but then only one year they gave because their mandate is different, not for higher education, because uh, therefore many trusts are not able to give. Then afterwards, we have been consistently been uh, funded uh, quite generously by Infosys Science Foundation. In fact, our uh, funding and things with a relationship with Infosys Foundation, Science Foundation, which, which is different from Infosys Foundation. So Infosys Science Foundation is, uh, you know, see, we remember that we are doing it, we are just an informal body. We don't have a NGO or we don't even have a bank account or anything, okay? Uh, the way we run is we first identify a host institute. Then as a proposer, we write to the Infosys uh, Science Foundation. We write a program profile and then we form a budget taking into account a local, their uh, hostel and those expenses based on that. Then we give the proposal to them, Infosys Science Foundation. Then there is a memorandum of agreement which is drawn between the trustees, the chairman of the trustees of Infosys Science Foundation and the local host institutions, the registrar or finance officer or vice chancellor or one of them. They, that's when, so our signature, nowhere it comes. So we don't even have a way of even receiving funds or anything because we, I mean, we, we accept our personal account. We don't have any account in the name of uh, these things. Okay. So there, and so that's the way they give the money. They are quite generous in giving money. And they don't, I mean, the full academic program, they never say, you have to teach this subject, this has to be done, who you should call. There's nothing in, involved at all in that. They have given 100% freedom on what I should do, right? who you should be called at all. And when they proposal and all right from the beginning, when they give proposal, they are very particular, what are the things I am claiming? Okay, that they want to see whether how much you are achieved. 
and that uh, I mean is not interested in having an anecdotal uh, information. They want everything to be what they call as a metric, right? A measurable metric must be there. See, that is, uh, you know, is, uh, I mean, as a scientist, you all think that, you know, that was a bit constraining. And, you know, we feel that that was something for us and uh, it's a good eye opener. We find that it's very useful. You want to make a judgment on ourselves. Otherwise, we can be just happy with some two students praising you very much and then say, oh, we are doing a great work. We are doing great work. We can live in that world. But then, you know, here we have to we really look at all this reality. What are the ways it is? And they say that there should be three levels, the short term, mid term, and the long term. Long term, it is not yet come. But short term is immediately after the program, how successful your program is. Mid term is you have to see how students are sort of evolving. Before to short term, I mean, this is again they have suggested, and then they have told me if you have any alternate point of view, tell me, we can discuss and we'll come to that. I mean, it is not that this is what only thing we have to do, but if you have better suggestion, we can be accommodative in it. So for one thing we have we've been doing is have something called a pre and post PDDS question, which is when they enter, we just ask some question, which is a domain based subject based, whatever their prerequisites are there, some questions. And the questions we ask is the post PDDS after this program, there's a so, and if the program is good, the post must be better than the pre. In their corporate language, it is a baseline score. The baseline score, right, based on it, how the post things must be doing well. And uh, in these questions have to be sent to them before start of the program. And they said they will share this with any experts, anyone they want, and seek their opinion about the quality of the questions and all. Last, and then actually they did that. I was, I mean, last year they sent this to people like Rajaram Kananda and Spintavadiya and people like that. They have got, uh, they have sent and uh, they asked their opinion about everything. <clears throat> and sometimes the post PTS also comes down because for us also it's a learning thing, what to ask. Sometimes we plan that, uh, you know, we'll ask some topic because of our way of doing it, we may not be able to do it. We'll be doing it on the last day. They don't have time for students to understand them. So these kind of every time we learn something, we try to sometimes the post period is less than pre. We try to understand what is it? Is it type of problem? Is the questions, the teaching, whatever it is? Do we try to understand what are the corrective measures have to be taken in that? And these answers are evaluated by the uh, teacher who uh, who taught the program. These questions are also discussed along with them. And we should realize that the problems, the questions we ask are all quite unconventional compared with the way when sort of it is traditionally when it is done, okay? I mean, uh, perhaps <laughs> privately, I mean, I can tell you some examples of that, um, you know? See, what, usually what we try to do is you try to invert the question and answer, you know? Usually the people will say that, I mean, for example, in quantum mechanics, you will say that you're given a, given a wave function, you ask what is the probability of some a particular eigenvalue is coming. So we try to invert, you construct, I want this one. You can construct a wave function, which is going to give me this result. Then you ask the question, is it a, uh, you know, a unique, right? I mean, like that, we try to sort of move so that, you know, they try to think and they get an answer for that. One typical question is, you know, you mean, you know, you give the matrix, ask them to find eigenvalue. That is a traditional thing. We tell them that, you know, I need a matrix with a given eigenvalue, right? You first construct a matrix. Then when we do that, in fact, this experiment I did in um, this problem I gave in the quantum mechanics course in a workshop for a small workshop conducted in Madurai. The students, uh, it's only for Tamil Nadu based students. The students whole class was very excited because then they went out and product and they are trying different things, right? I mean, uh, it took some time to realize that you know, most is direct answer what they can give. Right, it's are giving a direct answer, and then they and what they found is that they one student could you know construct a non-admission matrix which gives a real again. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, please stop me. Yeah, yeah. So this is the last. Yeah, in fact, I want to. So this assignment I have to do every. Uh, you know, this is a kind of a Excel sheet I have to send to thing. I have to follow every student from 2015 onwards to 2022. Right, I have a okay, uh, Excel sheet of every student, what they are doing it, where they were when they started the program, where they are now, right? What are the marks they got? Like that, this has to be uh, submitted every year. 
and only if I submit and based on the satisfaction is what we will be going for the uh, so next year. Okay. See, apart from this, we have been the last two slides are there. So, <clears throat> apart from this, we have been doing other program. This is a basic program. Okay. First thing is we have been we had a program uh, for a two-day workshop for experimental physics. You know, the way we have been doing it, we invited all the experimental teachers from different places, right? And we just sat down, we took each of us took one subject. We just devised experiments which can be given here. Right? They have to just say this experiment which can be done. So five days, you know, so that's the one thing. So that that is very helpful because we got uh, good resource persons we could get from this one. Second, right? We have been running, uh, last uh, recently, we have been running a five day program which caters only for the local region. This has been very successful because, uh, you know, not many people can come to the main program. So, so this is uh, again a scope for us to in sort of do that. <coughs> and see, this again, I don't know how many of you know, his name is Carl Weyman. He got a Nobel Prize in physics. And he, after his Nobel Prize work, he has been doing a lot of physics education activity. He has popularized the word active learning, which actually when we did, we did not actually know that. Now we have really given, uh, 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 see what he did at all. So once I approached him, I wrote him saying that I've been doing in this program, these things, can you help me to conduct a workshop? And actually we had an online workshop with two of his close associates were the resource persons. And this is his talk. He came for the welcome mentors, he was there. And uh, so this is again, uh, we, we had collaboration it, so we are still in touch with him. I mean, how to sort of implement these things. And the last uh, year, we have started one new thing for the teachers. We have started in this um, uh, January, a few months back, uh, in collaboration with uh, ICTS. I had a program which is called uh, PTTP Physics Training, Physics Teachers Training Program. That's our first program. We just took uh, uh, college student teachers, MSc teachers who've been teaching quantum mechanics. Right, only that subject. We took about 25 teachers uh, across India. And uh, there again, we had got a very innovative things are there. One is we got a project-based learning. I mean, apart from a traditional way of teaching and all, we took on American Journal of Physics type, I mean, American Journal of Physics articles, which is again at a BMSC first semester courses, first few chapters of quantum mechanics. Only with that knowledge, we just took, read the abstract and made that into a kind of a project. We divided the students into groups and asked the teachers to, I mean, to do those uh, things. And that has been a very, very successful uh, thing. We also had something on how to have a visual quantum mechanics and all, which they can do. So this, again, it's a new thing which we feel that uh, there's a lot of scope for us to really do. As I said, our basic uh, thing will be to contribution to the society is, you know, we use completely we do for women empowerment. And as I said, 50% of the seats we take, I see that, the last uh, year onwards, we have introduced one more thing. We found that many uh, women going from MSc to PhD is less compared with men. So we thought possibly it's because they get married and they are not coming to the society. I mean, so what we have done is about five seats, extra numeracy seats, we have reserved for women who had a break in career due to family reasons. So we are uh, we asked them to just, uh, we took them. And in fact, one of them is so successful. Now we say she's doing, in Isar, Kolkata, doing a very successful project with uh, with someone uh, with Kaushik Tatar. So she is, uh, I mean, so this kind of a yeah, uh, thing is also been, and of course, rural development. Uh, see, one more thing is what we want to emphasize is what we are interested is not a student really go from a student from a college goes to Princeton or Harvard and all. That's not what we are aiming at. We want to see there is an upward academic mobility is there. So we'll be very happy. We'll generally be very happy something which we always tell the funding agency, right? I mean, you just see how much is a upward social academic mobility is that. Somebody from a small college in a rural place, if he comes to city to do MSc, then we feel we are happy. Somebody doing an MSc in a college, if he goes to one of the research institute, then we are happy, right? That is what we have to sort of aim to do, right? Not just to see that, you know, we can, see, we are not having a magic wand, you touch something, they immediately going to uh, become a great thing, right? I mean, this is a kind of a slow process if they do it. So, I mean, we feel in the largest sense, this parameter of looking at the upward social mobility is a better way of uh, judging or, you know, doing that rather than, you know, going, everybody going to IITs or some places and all, maybe the many suicides and all as this things can be the reason. <clears throat> okay. We have, have a difficulty how to introduce active learning. Syllabus completion and all will be a problem. We, we don't know how to do that. 
there was also a laboratory course how to implement in this is also a open uh, challenge how to do that. Maybe we have to give scope at least for students to come out with a conceptualizing that. Even if they don't do that, they should be given scope for it so that they should learn physics is designing the experiment rather than actually turning the knobs. And how we can make the evaluation something more challenging. Right? There, I mean, I have a lot of ideas because that is also something which one can make this physics be more sort of exciting. So we have been, see, so far we have been doing it completely as an informal body. So we have been planning, we are in the process of uh, forming a company. Uh, so that's something we are going to do. So we want to promote new back and more than the education research. And main thing is that we want to have a network of like-minded teachers. So these are my uh, collaborators. Apart from me, it's Raghavan Dangarajan. Many people know he works in astroparticle physics. He's now in Ahmedabad University. Other is SDM Satyanarayana. He is now in uh, Calcutta. He is now in Pondicherry University. And earlier he was in IGCAR. He works in uh, computational condensed matter physics. Right? So I am the main person who is spending a lot of time. And uh, the, all of them, you know, Sat Raghu, Raghu is uh, one of the very good administrator, organizer, you know, very meticulous person. Many of these are very big. And Satya is a very good, you know, he remembers all the students in any stage, 2015, this student where he is and all years, that kind of a very phenomenal memory. And um, so I've been involved fully in getting funds and uh, conceptualizing this program. So I've been, in, uh, so in that sense, I've been as a chief coordinator. Uh, my job is, I mean, I'm almost full time involved in that, maintain the website to everything else. Okay, with this, I will stop. So thank you, Professor Shiva Kumar. I think we are running a little bit uh, late. So now we should start the panel discussion. And as we heard in the talk that we want to make learning or any conversation, uh, it has to be very active. So we don't want uh, to sit for hours and keep listening to other people. Rather, it should be interactive. So for that, uh, I may I, uh, so maybe we should need, Acha, what do we do? Should we put the chairs? And I can sit uh, that side as the moderator. So uh, let me stop. So, so uh, now we should start the panel discussion. So initially, I'll just ask the panelists. Uh, to share their views and then we'll open the floor for questions because it has to be interactive. We want to hear from the young stars what they are thinking. And the topic of uh, today's discussion is the changing face of higher education in India. So may I request uh, our Professor Shiva Kumar to take the seat on stage. We have with us Professor Patrasharati Mojindar. Uh, we have with us Professor Raka Dash Gupta from Calcutta University and uh, Professor Shuparna Raichodhuri from St. Xavier's College and Professor Partho Ghosh from Bangobashu College. So I, as far, I should not be saying this, but as far, uh, I have, I think, part of panelists in mind who I know are fantastic teachers and are immensely popular among the students. So please welcome our panelists. And uh, now uh, we will, I will, so I, I will be moderating the program. And maybe just, if you give me a few minutes, I'll just stop the, uh, the thing. I'll just end the meeting. <laughs> 